The Teamsters Safety and Health Department is pleased to present a webinar on the COVID-19 vaccines currently available in the U.S., including a review of the implementation strategy. The webinar will be followed by a brief question and answer segment covering questions previously submitted by Teamster members. My name is Anjali DeGrasse, Deputy Director of the IBT Safety and Health Department, and I will be your facilitator for today's webinar. Please note that information presented in today's webinar may change as new information is developed. Continue to check the CDC website, your local or state public health department website, and teamster.org for pertinent updates relative to COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine. The information presented in today's webinar is current as of March 17, 2021. The Teamsters Union is proud to partner with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, a federal agency within the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Our guest speaker, Dr. Margaret Kitt, is the Deputy Director at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in the United States. She shares with the NIOSH Director the responsibility for the Institute's research and program operations and oversees the NIOSH Global Health Programs. Dr. Kitt is an occupational medicine physician and has worked for NIOSH since 2002. She worked at the NIOSH Division of Respiratory Disease Studies and led the NIOSH Emergency Preparedness and Response Office before assuming her current position. She was a senior flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force serving for 14 years and then spent 16 years in the United States Public Health Service, retiring in 2018 at the rank of Rear Admiral. Dr. Kitt is currently the team lead for the Essential Workers Team as a part of the Vaccine Implementation Unit within the CDC COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. Welcome, Dr. Kitt. Thanks so much, Anjali, um, and thanks to the Teamsters for organizing this opportunity to speak with you today about COVID-19 vaccine. So in the one year since COVID-19 infections were first identified, multiple COVID-19 vaccines have been developed and put through clinical trials with the support of the U.S. government. So far, three have received FDA emergency use authorizations. Vaccination is a critical tool in bringing this unprecedented pandemic to an end. CDC continues to work with states to understand roadblocks and figure out how to overcome challenges in distribution and administration to ensure that we are getting vaccines into arms as quickly and safely as possible. As of March 16th, nearly 111 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been administered. COVID-19 vaccination is a safer way to help build protection. Getting the virus that causes COVID-19 may offer some natural protection or immunity, but we don't yet know how long this natural immunity lasts. The risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19 far outweighs any benefits of natural immunity. Getting the COVID-19 vaccine builds immunity without the risk of severe disease. Three vaccines have received emergency use authorizations or EUAs from the FDA. One produced by Pfizer-BioNTech, another produced by Moderna, and a third produced by Johnson & Johnson, which you may also hear referred to as the Janssen vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine is authorized for persons aged 16 years and older, while the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccine is authorized for persons 18 years and older. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are administered with a two-dose schedule separated by 21 days in the case of Pfizer and 28 days in the case of Moderna. The J&J &J vaccine is a single-dose shot. The three vaccines were tested in diverse adult populations, including minorities and older adults. 
All of the available vaccines have been proven effective at preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19 disease. It is currently unknown how long the protection from receiving a COVID-19 vaccine might last, but data to determine this are being collected now. As data on vaccine effectiveness becomes available, CDC will provide regular updates with that information. Let's talk a little bit about how these vaccines work. To trigger an immune response, many vaccines put a weakened or inactivated microorganism into our bodies. That is not the case with mRNA vaccines. Instead, mRNA vaccines teach our cells how to make a harmless spike protein. This spike protein is found on the surface of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. This spike protein serves as an antigen to trigger an immune response inside our bodies. That immune response, which produces antibodies, is what protects us from getting infected when the real virus enters our bodies. Viral vector vaccines, like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, use a modified virus, not the COVID-19 virus, to enter our bodies and trigger our cell machinery to produce a harmless piece of the virus, again, that spike protein, which is found on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which then later will trigger the body's own immune system when the COVID-19 virus is encountered. And this is not a live virus vaccine. Like all vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines have been rigorously tested for safety before being authorized for use in the United States. The vaccine technology, technology has been studied for decades, including the mRNA virus vaccine technology used for Pfizer and Moderna and the viral vector vaccines such as Johnson & Johnson. These vaccines do not carry a risk of causing disease in the vaccinated person. It's also important to know that the genetic material delivered by the COVID-19 vaccines does not affect or interact with the person's DNA. We realize that some folks have concerns about the safety of these first COVID-19 vaccines. These vaccines were developed based on years of research. While mRNA technology is new, it is not unknown. mRNA technology has been studied for decades in vaccine trials for influenza, Zika, and rabies. Beyond vaccines, cancer research has also used mRNA to trigger the immune system to target specific cancer cells. Scientists began creating viral vectors back in the 1970s. Viral vectors have also been studied for gene therapy to treat cancer and for molecular biology research. Some vaccines recently used for Ebola outbreaks have used viral vector technology and a number of studies have focused on viral vector vaccines against other infectious diseases such as Zika, flu, and HIV. Because of all this experience with the technology, these vaccines were able to be developed more quickly. Additionally, the US government and vaccine manufacturers invested millions of dollars to scale up vaccine production while clinical trials were still in progress, greatly reducing the amount of time between vaccine authorization and vaccine implementation. Because of the great financial risk, this type of investment in manufacturing normally doesn't happen until later in the development process. mRNA vaccines are also faster and less expensive to produce than traditional vaccines. And lastly, because of the severity of the pandemic, FDA and CDC are making review and approval of COVID-19 vaccines a top priority in order to move the process along in an expeditious manner. I'd like to go over some key facts about COVID-19 vaccination and address some common myths. Fact, getting vaccinated can help prevent getting sick with COVID-19. The vaccine teaches your immune system how to recognize and fight the virus that causes COVID-19, and this protects you from getting sick with the disease. We believe that people who have been sick with COVID-19 may still benefit from getting vaccinated. Due to the severe health risks associated with COVID-19 and the fact that reinfection with COVID-19 is possible, Vaccines should be offered to you regardless of whether you have already had the infection. Right now, we do not know how long someone is protected from getting sick again after recovering from COVID-19. 
Another way of saying this is that we do not know how long natural immunity keeps you from being reinfected and getting sick again, but it is being extensively studied. COVID-19 vaccines will not give you the disease. None of the authorized vaccines in the United States contain the live virus that causes COVID-19, so it cannot make you sick with the disease. These COVID-19 vaccines will not cause you to test positive on COVID-19 viral tests which are used to see if you have a current infection. If your body develops an immune response, which of course is the goal of vaccination, there is a possibility you may test positive on some antibody tests, a marker of protection against the virus. Experts are currently looking at how the COVID-19 vaccinations may affect those antibody testing results. COVID-19 vaccines are being held to the same safety standards as other routine vaccines. External expert panels evaluate clinical trial data and advise the FDA and CDC. In the case of CDC, this advisory panel is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP. Even after authorization, both FDA and CDC continue to closely monitor vaccine safety. We have the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, which is an established national system that collects reports from healthcare professionals, vaccine manufacturers, and the public on adverse events that happen after vaccination for all vaccines. This data is analyzed by both CDC and FDA. We also have VSAFE, which is a new smartphone-based post-vaccination health checker for people who receive COVID-19 vaccines. Let's talk about Be Safe in a little more detail. It is a smartphone-based tool that uses text messaging and web surveys to provide personalized health check-ins after receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Through Be Safe, participants can quickly tell CDC if they have any side effects after getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Depending on the answer submitted, someone from CDC may call to check on participants and get more information. We encourage everyone who receives a vaccine to participate and be safe. You should receive information on how to enroll at the time of vaccination. Data collected through Be Safe is continuously evaluated, and Be Safe is now available in Spanish, Vietnamese, Korean, and simplified Chinese. Just in the last few weeks, CDC published new guidance for those recently fully vaccinated, which is defined as two weeks after the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or two weeks after the single dose Johnson & Johnson. Fully vaccinated people can visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors without masks or social distancing, visit with other unvaccinated people from a single household if unvaccinated persons are low risk for severe COVID-19 indoors without masks or social distancing. They can also refrain from quarantine and testing following a known exposure of COVID-19 if asymptomatic. But for now, fully vaccinated individuals should still take precautions in public, including masking and physical distancing avoiding medium and large size in-person gatherings. They should get tested if experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, follow any guidance that is issued by individual employers, and continue to follow CDC and health department travel requirements and recommendations. COVID-19 vaccination will be an important tool to help stop the pandemic, but it continues to be just one tool in our toolbox. While these vaccines appear to be highly effective, it will take time to get everyone vaccinated, so additional preventive tools remain important to limit the spread of COVID-19. The combination of getting vaccinated and following CDC's recommendations to protect yourself and others will offer the best protection from COVID-19. You need to continue to wash your hands, avoid close contact, cover your nose and mouth with a mask, and clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces. Successful implementation of COVID-19 vaccination requires a multiple phase plan with distinct strategies for achieving target vaccine coverage 
as doses of vaccine become available. As you all know, there is currently limited vaccine supply, but we are gradually seeing increases in that supply. In the early phase, plans concentrated on identifying critical priority populations, such as healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents, achieving vaccination coverage in those groups through focused administration sites. As supply increases, plans will be able to expand vaccinations to broader populations through many different administration sites, including more pharmacies, doctor's offices, clinics, mobile clinics, and temporary offsite clinics. With the rollout of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there are certain considerations for its use. It does not have the same freezer requirements, so it can be more easily it can be used more easily in certain settings, such as healthcare provider offices and mobile clinics. Since it's a single dose vaccine, it may be more desirable by those who want to be fully vaccinated more quickly, those who don't want to or can't easily return for a second shot, or populations that are highly mobile or on the other extreme that may be homebound. Let's talk about recommendations for vaccine prioritization that you've all heard about. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, is an independent federal advisory committee on med of medical and public health experts that provides advice and guidance to the CDC director on the most effective means to prevent vaccine preventable diseases in the United States. While ACIP and CDC make national recommendations, these recommendations will be adapted locally. The phased vaccine recommendations are meant to be fluid and not restrictive for jurisdictions. For COVID-19 vaccine prioritization, the U.S. adult population is broadly divided into overlapping categories based on occupation as an essential worker, as well as age and the presence of underlying medical conditions. In the first phase of allocation, which was phase 1A, Healthcare personnel and long-term care facility rec residents were recommended to receive vaccine. These groups are followed by frontline essential workers and adults 75 years and older in phase 1B. And next are the remaining essential workers, adults 65 to 74 years and 16 to 64 year olds with high risk medical conditions in phase 1C. Shown here is a broad list of frontline essential workers prioritized under ACIP's phase 1B of COVID-19 vaccine allocation, as well as a list of other essential workers prioritized in phase 1C. ACIP used guidance on essential critical infrastructure workers from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, to define frontline essential workers as workers who are in sectors essential to the functioning of society and are at substantially higher risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2 due to their work duties. These include groups like first responders, teachers and support staff, manufacturing workers, grocery store workers, food and agricultural workers, and others. And there are approximately 30 million frontline essential workers. Other essential workers include those in transportation and logistics, food service, construction, and water and wastewater, among others. It's important to note that jurisdictions have the final say on how vaccine is distributed to their populations. CDC released a more detailed list to help state, local, tribal, and territorial officials and organizations prepare for the allocation of initially limited COVID-19 vaccine supply. This list maps the CISA guidance to both standardized industry codes and titles and corresponding COVID-19 vaccination phases and workforce categories as recommended by ACIP. There are many potential challenges for the vaccination of frontline essential workers. A given jurisdiction may have a large number of frontline workers to vaccinate and state and local health authorities may need to sub-prioritize vaccination. Workers may work in one state, but live in another. A great deal of coordination and planning may be required to take advantage of the timing when staff are eligible to be vaccinated. Jurisdictions may want to consider the use of work sites to administer vaccine, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. 
and transient work workforces or workers whose job involves interstate transportation may have difficulty getting that second dose. Given the variety of industry sectors included in essential worker categories, jurisdictions need to be aware that some workers may have concerns about vaccine safety. There may be a need for culturally appropriate vaccination information in multiple languages. Rural areas may have limited access to healthcare and health providers and may require targeted strategies for vaccine implementation. Again, worksite vaccination sites or mobile vaccination units may want to be considered for these areas. Preferred methods of communication may be different for different groups. For example, radio, print, and social media may be best for different audiences. It can be important to rely on community leaders to serve as trusted sources for information. It is possible that some workers may miss work due to post-vaccination side effects, especially the day after vaccination and especially after the second dose. So it is important to plan for this possibility. And lastly, we know that critical infrastructure employers have an obligation to manage the continuation of work in a way that best protects the health of their workers and the general public. There are approximately 8 million workers in the TWU sector, a large portion of whom have been designated as essential workers. Workers from TWU are employed in all types of working arrangements. Examples of public sector workers include urban and rural transit, school bus drivers, and water and sewer truck operators. The private sector employs warehousing workers as well as professional drivers. Some workers may be employed in seasonal or temporary jobs. In rural areas, some transportation workers are volunteer and unpaid and may be responsible for taking folks to vaccine appointments and to other services. TWU working environments are also very diverse. COVID-19 risk factors for TWU workers vary as well. For example, transit workers encounter members of the general public, some of who may be infected. Some transit workers have been given the task of transporting passengers that have or are suspected of having COVID-19. In contrast, warehousing workers don't often interact with the public, but may work near other workers for long periods of time in close contact. Truck drivers may interact with the public at truck stops, travel plazas, or fueling stations. Some of the TWU subsectors have workers with union representation, but many are not represented. Within just the transportation sector of TWU, worker groups include public transit, aviation, truck drivers, maritime, and postal workers. There are unique challenges to vaccinating essential transportation workers. Given the mobile nature of many of these workers who regularly cross county and state lines, it is difficult to get workers two doses of a vaccine in the same location while not interfering with their work schedule. Also, some jurisdictions have prioritized residents from within their own county or state, sometimes making it difficult for interstate drivers to get vaccinated when they are away from home. Some states are recognizing this challenge and offering vaccines to non-state residents, but this does vary state by state. In addition to the essential nature of the work itself, we know that some transportation workers may be at increased risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19 due to chronic health conditions. For example, obesity and diabetes are twice as prevalent among long haul truck drivers as the US worker population as a whole it is especially important to get these workers fully vaccinated. Our partners have shared concerns about how to handle drivers who develop post-vaccine symptoms while they are on the road. This challenge is similar to what transportation companies have already faced for drivers who develop COVID-19 symptoms while on the road. Some possible solutions include the possibility of offering the one dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine with long haul truck drivers and other mobile workers to reduce logistical challenges and possibly reduce the amount of worker sick leave needed. But whichever vaccine is used, careful 
scheduling and pre-planning for vaccine administration will be required in this workforce. Partnerships between local health departments, trucking companies, and truck stop travel plaza companies to bring vaccine clinics to places where these workers congregate, congregate is also a promising solution. Employers considering implementing a workplace COVID-19 vaccination program should contact the health department in their jurisdiction for guidance. The planning process should include input from management, human resources, employees, and labor representatives. Employers should offer the vaccination at no charge and during work hours if possible. They should also offer flexible paid leave policies for those workers that may experience post-vaccination symptoms. If hosting a vaccination clinic at your workplace is not possible, consider other steps to encourage vaccination. You can encourage vaccination by providing information to your workers about where they can get the vaccine. Be flexible in your human resources policies. Establish policies that allow employees to take paid leave to seek COVID-19 vaccination in the community and support transportation to off-site vaccination clinics. Use promotional posters and flyers to advertise locations that are offering COVID-19 vaccination in the community. Display these posters about vaccination in break rooms, cafeterias, and other high traffic areas. And these may need to be available in various languages. Post articles and company communications, such as newsletters, intranet sites, and company-wide emails about the importance of COVID-19 vaccination and where to get the vaccine in the community. I wanted to just mention a few of the other programs that exist to help in the administration of vaccines across the country. The Federal Retail Pharmacy Program for COVID-19 vaccination is a public-private partnership that involves 21 national pharmacy partners and networks of independent pharmacies, representing over 40,000 retail and long-term care pharmacy locations nationwide. This program is being incrementally rolled out as more vaccine becomes available. Coordination for the program is at the federal level with the goal of increasing access to vaccine, improving vaccine uptake, and decreasing the logistical and operational burden on public health. Through this program, select partners receive a direct allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. Almost 90% of people live within five miles of a community pharmacy. Pharmacies have unique reach and ability to provide access to COVID-19 vaccine and support broad vaccination efforts. Just a reminder that vaccine administered at all locations is at no cost to individuals. To ensure our nation's underserved communities and those populations disproportionately affected by COVID-19 are equitably vaccinated, the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, and the CDC launched a program to directly allocate a limited supply of COVID-19 vaccine to select HRSA funded health centers, which care for disproportionately affected populations. And this began the week of February 15th. Again, this is an incremental effort as more vaccine becomes available and will be carried out in coordination with the jurisdictions and the health centers. Nationwide, nearly 1400 HRSA funded health centers operate approximately 13,000 sites, providing primary and preventive care to nearly 30 million patients each year. Health centers across the nation are really playing a vital role in supporting local community responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. The initial health centers chosen for this program include those that serve a large volume of one of the following populations, either public housing residents, migrant or seasonal agricultural workers, people with limited English speaking skills, or people experiencing homelessness. Switching gears a little bit, I wanted to mention that as part of the CDC response to COVID-19, the Vaccine Task Force created an essential workers team. This team is dedicated to vaccine implementation for essential workers through linkages with workers, industry, labor, and other stakeholders. It works to provide vaccine information to essential workers and employers, as well as support jurisdictions in its vaccination efforts for workers. 
The team includes many NIOSH subject matter experts who are very experienced in working with workers across these various industries. CDC has created a toolkit to help employers educate their essential workers about this important new prevention tool. This toolkit includes multiple adaptable resources to address common questions and concerns and raise awareness about the benefits of COVID-19 vaccination, including key messages, slide decks, frequently asked questions, posters and flyers to post around workplaces, newsletter content and sample letters to members, as well as social media content. Please go to the link at the bottom of the slide to access the toolkit. And we encourage you to share this widely with your network and your members. Although we're excited to have vaccines available, it will take some time to vaccinate all people in the United States. There will be challenges along the way, but CDC is committed to working with partners to find solutions. It's important that everyone continue to take all the steps to prevent spread of COVID-19. Continue to wear a mask, social distance, and wash your hands frequently, even after vaccination. It's also important to remember that workplace safety and health protections previously implement, implemented to protect workers, for example, barrier protections, need to remain in place post-vaccination. I know many of you are interested in learning more about how to coordinate with your state and local health departments about vaccine rollout. We suggest you visit your state health department or state governor COVID-19 vaccine website for additional information and points of contact as it does vary state by state. It's my hope that when it comes your turn, you all will choose to get vaccinated and that you will encourage employees, coworkers and union members to be vaccinated as well. If you have already been vaccinated, please share your experience with your friends, families, and coworkers. Please share information on the vaccine as well as information on how vaccine distribution is working in your community. So thank you for giving me some of your time today and I'm happy to answer further questions that you may have about COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Kitt for providing such valuable information during this webinar about the vaccine. The Teamsters Union is taking this very seriously and are really developing a strategy in which we can provide the best and most useful information to our membership regarding the COVID-19 vaccines available. As a part of this uh, strategy, we did send out uh, a request for questions from some of our Teamster unions, local union affiliates, et cetera. And I do have some questions uh, that I'd like to pose to you directly from our membership. The first question we have is based on um, the variants. So is there evidence to show how effective either of the vaccines currently available to essential workers um, to show that they are effective against the multiple variants of the COVID virus that are out now. I know that there's a South uh, African variant, a European variant um, of this strain of virus. So do you have any um, response to maybe how effective the vaccines are against the variants? Yeah, thanks, Anjali. Um, and it, uh, it is a really important question, one we hear a lot. Um, early data does indeed show that the vaccines um, are, are working against some of the variants, but may be a little less effective against the others. We're still continuing to study how effective the vaccines are against variants of the virus that cause the COVID-19. Um, it is important to note that Johnson & Johnson's vaccine was studied in multiple countries, including South Africa and Brazil, both places where the variants of COVID-19 have been seen to emerge. Um, and these clinical trial, trials with the vaccine were ongoing as variants um, began circulating. We also know that, continue, that we're continuing to monitor for these new variants um, for any impact on real world vaccine effectiveness. So um, that said, however, COVID-19 vaccines really do continue to be an essential um, tool to protect people against COVID-19, including against new variants. And, it's really important that people get vaccinated as soon as possible, um, knowing that these variants um, are occurring out there in communities. 
Oh, wonderful. That's great to know um, that there have been there has been research to show that the vaccine can still be effective against the variants. Awesome. Um, so will folks have to get the COVID-19 vaccine every year, like um, per se the flu vaccine? Well, we don't know yet. Um, the need for um, and timing for COVID-19 booster doses really hasn't been established yet, but we're certainly um, studying it. At this time, no additional doses are recommended. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, we're really trying to study how these vaccines are working in real world settings, um, as opposed to the clinical trials where um, they were tested before emergency use authorization. But right now, we just don't know what the requirements will be, if there will be any for annual boosters. More to come on that. Okay. All right. And, and speaking of real world settings, um, women, women who uh, are pregnant now or who may plan to become pregnant in the near future, um, has there been any data to show that the vaccines are safe for that population? Well, well first and foremost, it's really important that any woman discuss these issues um, with a healthcare provider, with their healthcare provider. The, the risk of getting COVID-19 infection while pregnant is certainly a concern, so vaccination should be considered. Um, overall, the answer is yes. Um, if you're pregnant, you may choose to be vaccinated when it's available to you. Um, there's currently no evidence that antibodies formed from the COVID-19 vaccine cause any problems with pregnancy. Women who are trying to become pregnant now or certainly who plan to try in the future may also receive the COVID-19 vaccine um, when it's available to them. There's no evidence currently that fertility problems are a side effect of any vaccine, include, including the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, CDC, again, continues to monitor this issue, but really, if there's any questions about getting vaccinated, it's important that women really have a, um, a good conversation with the healthcare provider to, to make an informed decision. That is very important. Yes, have that conversation, ladies, with your healthcare provider. Okay, um, and I know that we talked about um, three different vaccines today in the webinar. And can you shine a light on the efficacy of either of the three vaccines? Um, are some more effective than others? Um, if we have a choice between the vaccines, um, how should we make that decision? So all the, of the available vaccines, all three have been proven to be effective at preventing serious illness, hospitalizations, and, and death from COVID-19 disease. The different types of vaccines were not studied in direct head-to-head -head comparisons or clinical trials. Um, they were conducted at different points in time. So it's really difficult to compare the results directly to one another, but um, important to know that they all are effective at presenting those serious illnesses, hospitalizations, and death. CDC really recommends that you get whichever vaccine is available to you when eligible, um, regardless of which vaccine is offered. Um, if it's your turn and one of those three vaccines is available, we recommend you get it. Sure. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Um, so here's another question that I received multiple times. Um, once, once you get vaccinated, um, is there a potential for you, even if you are not sick uh, or don't get severely sick or ill from the virus, is there a potential that you can still transmit it to others around you um, and not know it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't yet know whether getting a COVID-19 vaccine will prevent you from spreading the virus that causes COVID-19 to other people, um, even if you don't get sick yourself. So um, we'll continue to study this and to update the website as we learn more. But because we don't yet know, it's still important that fully vaccinated persons um, continue to take all those steps to protect themselves and others. Those ones we've mentioned over and over again, like wearing a mask and keeping physically distanced when, when in public and um, washing your hands frequently. Um, those are the um, really important steps we need to continue to take at this point. 
Okay, all right. Um, and I now have a question from our driving population. Um, a lot of the drivers who are over the road drivers who may not return to the same reporting location um, each night, um, their question is, if they sign up to get the first available two-dose vaccine, either Moderna or Pfizer at this point, um, are they required to go back to the same location to get the second shot? Or is there an opportunity for them to just schedule their second shot wherever they are located at that time? Yeah, this is, is potentially a real challenge and we, we understand that. Um, if you received a two-dose vaccine, the, the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, um, you do not need to receive the second dose in the same location where you received the first dose. However, it's important that you get the same vaccine for both your first and second dose. So if you got Moderna to get for the first dose, that you get Moderna for the second dose. Um, when you get your COVID-19 vaccine, you should receive a vaccination card that tells you which vaccine you received, the date you received it, and where you received it. It's really important to keep that vaccination card in case you need it for the future. Um, as mentioned, the single dose J and J vaccine might be preferable by people who want to complete their vaccination quickly or um, may have difficulty getting that second dose. Um, but so, so in summary, you don't need to return to the same place, but um, you need to try and figure out an arrangement of where to get that second dose. And, and that we know that that can be a challenge, especially if you're crossing over from state to state. Right, I, d I definitely think so. Um, and in that same line of questioning, um, say you did get the first dose um, of either the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, um, but you missed your second appointment or for whatever number of reasons were unable to return within that time period um, between doses to get that second dose. Um, is there uh, still a possibility for um, you to get that second dose even six weeks past the recommended dosing interval um, if you're able to? Um, or has that affected or will that um, missed dose affect the efficacy of the vaccine at all? So CDC still recommends that people get their second shot of the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines as close to the, that recommended, recommended interval as possible. So that's three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks for Moderna. Um, you shouldn't get the second dose any earlier than that recommended interval. But well, CDC also says um, that if it's not feasible to comply with that recommended interval for whatever reason, um, that the second dose of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines can be scheduled for administration up to about six weeks after the first dose. Currently, only limited data really is available on the efficacy of these vaccines that are administered um, after that six-week window. Um, just to reiterate, the, the COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable. The, the safety and efficacy of series really hasn't been tested. So both doses of the series should be completed with the same product, either um, Moderna and Moderna or Pfizer and Pfizer. Um, some questions also arise about whether um, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine could be taken as a single dose and after a first shot of Moderna or Pfizer and then skip that second dose altogether. The, the safety and efficacy of the j, &J vaccine administered after an mRNA vaccine has not been established as of yet. Um, we recognize there may be really extraordinary situations where um, a person may have received a first dose of a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, but is for whatever reason, absolutely unable to complete the series with that same um, mRNA vaccine, there may be a contraindication or they may have had maybe a severe allergic reaction. Um, and a single dose of J&J &J vaccine may be considered at a minimum interval of 28 days following that COVID-19 vaccine. And this is outlined in some of our, in our interim clinical considerations on the CDC website. 
but this is would be a really unusual circumstance and really would have to be um, well thought out with a healthcare provider whether that was an option at all. So hopefully I haven't confused anyone with that uh, <laughs> answer. So you know that's actually um, um, important um, because I didn't even think about. Um, those folks who may have had an allergic reaction to either Pfizer or Moderna, the mRNA vaccine, if they even had the po potential or, or opportunity to still get vaccinated with a, um, a vaccine of a different product like the J&J. &J. So that's um, a consideration that I think that folks um, should who may, who may be afraid of that um, should speak with their medical provider about um, and that they may still uh, potentially be eligible to get something, get protected by a vaccine. So that's good. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I know uh, that a lot of our essential workforce also um, just don't have that uh, time availability all the time um, to go one shot, two shot, three shot, four shot. And in the midst of flu season, um, is it, is it possible that you can maybe just go to the uh, health clinic and get all your vaccines in one day? Can you can you get flu shot and COVID on the same day <laughs> or anything else? Well, although it might sound like a good idea, um, we don't really have data that looks at the, the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines administered on the same days or at the same time as other vaccines. So Right now, the recommendation is to get a COVID-19 vaccine um, uh, administered alone with a minimum interval of 14 days before or after administration of any other vaccine. So hopefully people have already gotten their flu shots and it's been well over two weeks and they can have time now to get their COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, all right, wonderful. Um, so next uh, in, in the questions I received, um, what if I lose my vaccination card showing proof that I received the vaccine? Uh, can I get another one? And who would replace that? Who maintains the vaccine record? So um, anybody who gets vaccinated should be encouraged to make a backup copy of their vaccination card, either take a a picture of the card with their uh, great smartphone or make a photocopy so that you have a have a backup. Um, but also COVID-19 vaccination provider, providers are required to document vaccine administration in their um, record systems um, within 24 hours of the vaccine being administered. And they also have to report that, admin, um, that administration data um, to the jurisdiction within about 72 hours of giving someone a vaccine. So there should be a record of your vaccination there as well. Um, but please come, if, if this happens to anybody and you're concerned, you can't find your car, can't figure out your dates, um, please contact the state and local health department if you have questions about that vaccination record. Okay, all right, that's good to know. I know that can happen on occasion. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm gonna skip a couple questions on my list here that we received just in the interest of time. Um, is there's an important question that I wanna get to. Um, regarding um, vaccination, when you go to sign up for a vaccination, um, in the interest of privacy, is there any information that you must divulge um, to the administrator uh, when you go to or uh, prior to getting your vaccine. Um, you know, a lot of people are worried about their protected health information and who has access to that. So uh, is there anything um, that, um, that uh, folks should alert their um, administrator to prior to getting the vaccine um, or not so much? That's, that's an important uh, question to cover. No sharing of personal health information is required in order to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. However, if you have any precautions to receiving a COVID-19 vaccine, such as a history of an immediate allergic reaction to any other vaccine or injectable therapy, you should talk to your vaccine provider about that um, precaution and discuss it with them. Um, but any precautions you have um, should be discussed with your healthcare provider, maybe even before you go to the vaccination site um, to make sure that you um, are 
safe to get the vaccine and that you don't have any contraindications to receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. But oh. personal health information should, is, is protected. Okay. All right. And, and um, I just have two other questions before we close out. Um, a number of our, our driving population do suffer from diabetes mellitus, um, type 2 diabetes. Um, and you just talked about contraindications. Do you have any information to share on the folks who um, are su suffering from diabetes? Should they still get the COVID-19 vaccine? So people with underlying medical conditions, including diabetes, can certainly receive the FDA authorized vaccines as long as they have not once again had any immediate or severe allergic reaction to, to a COVID-19 vaccine or any of the ingredients in the vaccine. Um, vaccination is really an important consideration for adults of any age with underlying medical conditions, including diabetes, um, because they are at increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. So. Mm -hmm. So yes, they should should still get vaccinated unless there's some contraindication. Okay, and um, last question for you, and I thank you so much for, for taking our questions. Um, what precautions um, would a worker need to take after getting vaccinated? So, you know, uh, folks are asking if, if everybody in their workforce is vaccinated um, in their immediate work area, work group, do they still need to take the six foot recommended physical distancing? Do they still need to wear um, the face coverings that have been recommended by CDC, um, et cetera. What, what precautions would they need to take after getting a vaccine, vaccinated? If they themselves are the only one vaccinated or um, if, uh, if their whole work site is vaccinated, are there differing recommendations? So um, for now, um, if you've been fully vaccinated, you really should continue to protect yourself and those around you by wearing a mask and staying at least six feet apart from others whenever um, in public for, for all those reasons that we discussed before um, about not knowing whether you're still capable of, of transmitting um, virus to other people or not. Um, you'll also need to follow any guidance that's been established at your workplace. There may be some specific guidance that's been established by um, employers as well. Um, we're still learning how, how well COVID-19 vaccines keep people um, from spreading disease, how well they keep um, people from spreading disease. And although the early data show that the vaccines may indeed help keep people from spreading COVID-19, we really need to learn um, more before we feel comfortable um, making any change in those recommendations. Um, so until we know more, um, uh, even people who've had their vaccines really should continue to take those basic prevention steps. Well, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Kidd, and thank NIOSH for their continued partnership with the Teamsters throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond in providing resources, educational materials, um, and participating in, in our podcasts and, and webinar series. It's so appreciated. Um, and of course, for providing such useful and practical information today to our essential workforce. We appreciate you and look forward to continued partnership um, with NIOSH. Thanks so much. It's been my pleasure. And thanks to the Teamsters for all that they're doing as well. If you enjoyed this webinar, please visit our website at teamstersafety.org to explore the many training opportunities we offer at no cost to students throughout the United States. Teamster training centers are located throughout the U.S. and conduct courses at their own facilities, as well as on location at ports, construction projects, remediation sites, company locations, and union halls. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, a robust online training program has been developed so that we can continue to meet student training needs while keeping both instructors and students safe. For more information on our COVID-19 awareness class and other training classes offered, please visit our website at Teamster safety.org. The Teamster Safety and Health Department, led by Lamont Bird, provides comprehensive worker safety and health training to our rank and file membership 
through the worker training program, Teamsters apprenticeship program, and Rail Workers hazardous materials training program. We also provide technical and regulatory support to our local union affiliates, IBT trained divisions and conferences, and IBT departments, joint councils, and rank and file members. We work closely with the IBT Legislative Affairs Department and change to win Federation affiliates on various legislative and rulemaking activities that involve safety and health. Our staff members routinely conduct independent research on various safety and health issues, and from time to time, collaborate with research institutions and government agencies like NIOSH on projects where we share interests. This concludes our webinar. If you have any questions on topics you heard today, please do not hesitate to reach out to us for assistance. You may email us at elearning at teamstersafety.org or call us at 202-624-6960. Thank you.